learn about mental health, the more what we realize is that these are not diseases in the sense of um, uh, you, you know a cancer or a diabetes or a heart disease, but there really are lifelong vulnerabilities that when well managed uh, through various strategies, most of which by the way are not pharmacologic, most of these strategies are about living and about exercise and about self-care and community relationships, that when you manage them that way, they never have to become illness. On the one hand, the last thing we want to do is to make parents so anxious that they are looking for every last little sign. And as a parent myself, I vividly remember those uh, sleep-deprived nights where you imagine, oh my God, that my child has this problem or that problem. And the last thing we need to do is to make people more anxious about that. It's also true that there's virtually nothing that you see early on that is a certainty of a problem. In other words, uh, what you're seeing, 99% of the things you see go away. And we, we don't have any kind of certain measures, uh, with very, very few exceptions, early on in life. All that said, uh, a, a intelligence and knowledge about psychological factors does help one see w where every child has... The, the, the things they're good at and the things they could use some help with. And I would never call that by a diagnostic name. I would never want to call that an illness or alarm people in that way. But I do think there's an awful lot of education that can be done for, for parents and for, and for people in the community about how to help supplement where somebody may, maybe has, uh, has a little bit more of a tough time, uh, all under the normal umbrella. There are, there are probably, you know, conservatively speaking, at least a dozen different uh, factors that one could notice in early children, none of which, are, again, are diagnostic, none of which are diseases or illnesses or problems, but differences that every child sits along some spectrum, some continuum of. So just to illustrate what some of those are, and they hopefully would resonate with just people's experience. Um, some children are more cautious and some are more bold. Now, there's no right or wrong. One could argue there's advantages to being cautious. You, you end up not falling as much and scraping yourself up. And there's uh, um, advantages to being bold. You're more able to explore one's environment. And everybody, every child sits somewhere along that spectrum. And knowing how one helps a child on one side or the other, or even the child in the middle. You know, nobody teaches us how to be parents, so uh, we're often best at helping children who were similar to us. There's a wonderful book by Andrew Solomon called Far From the Tree, and one of the things he talks about in that book, um, which again is almost common sense when you think about it, is one of the hardest challenges for a parent is parenting a child who's very different than you because that's just not your experience, and you naturally do the things that you would have liked done, golden rule, but maybe that child needs something different. So that's one example, but I'll, I'll give you another. Uh, some children are just, have more social, uh, kind of built-in social connectivity than others. Now, that sounds like it's only a good thing, but it's not actually, because you could imagine being too socially attuned, particularly early on, is also a burden, because then you're very tied into everybody else's moods. And probably for most of these things, being somewhere in the middle is the easiest place to be. But what are the challenges for someone who's too socially attuned or less than usually socially attuned? That's another scale. And, and, and what it would look like would be uh, that one's pediatrician or teachers or other environments uh, or child psychiatrists would help parents uh, think about these things in a kind of um, normalizing way and say, you know, it looks like your child may be a little bit more bold than you are. You are a cautious child. Your child's more bold. Let me share some suggestions about some ways you might work with a more bold child that might be different than the way that, that your own parent worked with you. Uh, th th that's the nature it would take. And, and what we believe is that that personalizing uh, the early environment is quite protective of developing problems later on. I would argue that the biggest part of our quiver, our biggest arrow, is talk therapy or psychotherapy. Um, it doesn't mean we don't need medicine. 
Doesn't mean we don't need uh, um, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation and ketamine and electroconvulsive therapy. There's many other treatments. But talk therapy uh, has the, uh, the honor of being our oldest treatment for mental illness uh, and something that in one form or another has existed long before the word psychotherapy existed. Uh, it's the notion that through communication with other human beings, uh, we can change who we are, which is quite, quite a kind of exciting idea. And there's actually an enormous amount of evidence right now uh, that you can even measure how the brain changes in response to psychotherapy. That is, a, the conversation we're having is changing my brain, is changing your brain, right? And, of course, the more we talk, and we talk in certain ways, it may change more than others, and you can change it for bad, but, or you can change it for good. And so the art and science of psychotherapy is how do we develop those techniques in such a way as to be maximally useful to the individual. The, the question that answers, is this treatment going to work, is if you ask the patient and you ask the therapist, uh, do you think you're doing something useful together? Are you working well together? Do you like each other? That tells you. If the answer is yes, treatment is helpful. If the answer is no, doesn't matter how skilled and fancy and how much it costs, not a good treatment. And so one of the things I tell people who say to me, how do I find the right therapist? I say, I can give you some recommendations and you can ask people and so on. But at the end of the day, you say if you think it's helpful. You know, one of my core beliefs is, is that communication and connectivity among individuals is at the heart of how we improve, how we improve as people, as parents, as friends, as, uh, uh, as children, everything we do. Uh, and the more we can talk with each other, um, uh, not professional to patient, but uh, human being to human being, um, the more, not just we can learn, but we can help heal each other and overcome uh, all the challenges that are involved in mental illness. Um, to me, that's just a core aspect of the work of Silver Hill Hospital. It's the core a a um, uh, a part of a lot of advocacy organizations uh, that I've been involved in, and, and I, th I think it's, it's a cause for all of us to embrace. So, you know, the question around medications and whether there's overprescription is a very important one. You know, what I believe, uh, and, there, and there's, there's research to support this, is that rather than it be a, a simple case of overprescription, it's more likely a, a case of, of uh, misprescription. I, I, I think medications in general are, can be enormously helpful, and we are really fortunate you know, to, to live in a time when we have developed uh, as a field a number of medicines that, that, that really work very well for people with different disorders. Um, that doesn't mean every medicine is, is good for everybody. And unfortunately, there are forces, some of ignorance, some of greed, that can lead medicines to be misused. We have the ability to know and predict more about the vulnerabilities that individuals have than we ever dreamed was possible. And this is true whether you're doing 23andMe, one of these commercial uh, uh, DNA testing, um, but it's becoming so much more possible now in medical illness and mental illness that we really have to be as a society talking about what we want to do. I don't think there's any way to stop it. We're going to learn more about how uh, about the future. But I also think we have to be extremely careful not to believe that, that genetics are destiny. Uh, the amazing thing about human beings and, and more developed mammals in general is that the mixture of environment and genetics is constant. Uh, there is no psychiatric illness that is fully genetic, and there's no psychiatric illness that is fully uh, uh, environmental. They're all a combination. And in fact, the vast majority are somewhere around 50-50, as best we can tell at this point. So I would hate to think that we would identify some genetic predisposition to a certain illness and therefore decide that that child is fated to have that illness, because it's simply not true. And the flip side of this is, and this is probably falls under the category of evolutionary psychology, which, which can sometimes uh, be misused. But every trait we have as humans has some protective advantage. 
In other words, if, it, if there were a genetically determined trait that was truly 100% disadvantageous, the course of millions of years of evolution would have pulled that out of the population. So at some level, if we've inherited it, in some maybe very complex way, that trait had an advantage. I'll give you the classic example that's taught in every medical school. Uh, sickle cell anemia, it's in the news recently because it's actually the first genetic treatments actually to reverse it. it. Does not seem like something that anybody would ever want it to have. This is a purely genetic trait that in individuals with, a, with two copies, that is uh, from both parents, uh, uh, is fatal, fairly young, and, and is a very painful and, and horrible illness until, until death. If you have one copy, it's not great either, and uh, there are vulnerabilities. But it turns out that if you have one copy, you are resistant to malaria. And when human beings evolved in, in, in climates where there were a lot of mosquitoes and malaria was endemic, the choice between having a sickle cell trait and dying from malaria, because it was all, very often a, fa a fatal illness, was clear. It was better to have sickle cell trait. So this was retained in the genome because it had a protective factor. Now I use that as a concrete example of what is probably true about virtually every trait we have in, uh, in psychology. That is, there are advantages to being bold. There are advantages to being uh, um, cautious. There are advantages to being very social. There are advantages to being less social. There are advantages to uh, certain kinds of attention. Think of, uh, we talk about ADHD all the time. Well, why would that be there? Well, I always tell the story that when I was in medical school and the first time I ever worked in the emergency room, I saw a, a fleet of, of amazing doctors, all of whom had ADHD. They were so good at moving from one task to another quickly, retaining the different pieces, never staying too long with one because in the emergency room, that was important. Those same doctors would probably be terrible at sitting in a classroom for hours copying notes off the blackboard, whereas somebody else, that would be great, and maybe they became a professor, right? Totally different learning styles, but, but good for different things. And I think that perspective, when we bring it to understanding the mind and ultimately illness, uh, helps us appreciate why we don't want to limit the variability. We don't want to make everybody the same. That would be disastrous. We want to embrace the heterogeneity of the human mind and brain uh, uh, and respect that, but we also want to help each of those individuals find their place in society. What is co-occurring diagnosis and ultimately how do we treat it? And I think the, so, so what is it at, at a very basic level? Co-occurring diagnosis means that in our terminology, we, we name more than one illness or vulnerability in an individual. So we say you don't just have depression, you have depression and anxiety, or you have depression, anxiety, and substance abuse, or depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and um, borderline personality disorder, just to give some examples. Um, now what's helpful about that is uh, people are complicated. And the more we can use language to capture the things they're struggling with, uh, that's helpful. That should be. And people can often feel heard and seen when you say, oh, listen, it's not as simple as you just have this one thing or even these two things. You have multiple things. The danger, though, is we start to think of those as separate things. It turns out that our psychiatric terminology, because of the, how complex the human mind is, it's by far the most complex organ in the body, that we describe people's symptoms much more from a, a kind of superficial level of this is what's bothering them than the underlying cause. So the, the idea would be, let's say someone has pneumonia. What if you didn't know the word pneumonia? What if instead you said, oh, they have fever, they have cough, they have sweats, and uh, they have a headache. It sounds like they have four things. That's a co-occurring disorder. Fever, cough, sweats, and headache, right? But thankfully, the field of uh, uh, infectious disease has uh, evolved to the point that we know that's really just one thing. It's pneumonia. It has four manifestations in that individual, probably has five beyond that, but, but it's one thing, pneumonia. Imagine that in psychiatry, we don't have the word pneumonia yet. We have 
terms like depression, anxiety, substance abuse, personal disorder, which are more akin to symptom descriptions, and sometimes elaborate symptom descriptions, but nonetheless symptoms, and we haven't found how they are stitched together. So we're working on that problem, and there's a lot of research and a lot of scholarship that's going into that. In fact, I would argue that the term borderline personality disorder is closer to pneumonia than the others. It is more of a fundamental idea, but it's not fully fundamental. To be really fully fundamental, you have to be able to say what causes it. Pneumonia, we know it's certain kinds of bacteria or certain kinds of viruses, and you have to know exactly how it manifests itself in the physical body, right? We know where pneumonia, how the cells respond to the invasion of the bacteria, blah, blah, blah. We're in the brain, we're just starting to learn what it would mean to have an early life negative experience and how might that manifest itself in how the brain develops and in how the, the sense of self develops, et cetera. So, so, you know, we're still at a very early stage of defining that. And what I believe is that most of what we call co-occurring disorders today in the next decades, we're going to increasingly be able to understand what the underlying difficulties are and then and, and, and simplify it. But we're not there yet. And I would never want the, 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 the take home from what I just said to be, oh, co-occurring doesn't really exist, you just have one thing. Well, right now, given our terminology, we need to describe things in a co-occurring way. Let me say one more thing about co-occurring, and, and, and this should be intuitive in some ways. Milder illnesses are less likely to be co-occurring. If you have a mild form of depression, it's more likely to be just depression. If you have a mild form of anxiety, it's more likely to be just anxiety. What we know uh, from, the, from the data and the research is that once things get more, more severe, co-occurring becomes much more likely. So if you surveyed everybody with a mild form of depression, the rates of co-occurring would be low. Soon as the severity goes up, co-occurring becomes very common to the point of almost universal. So if you come to a psychiatric hospital where we treat more severe versions of illness, either on an inpatient unit or in a residential program that we have here at Silver Hill, virtually all of our patients have comorbidity. And that's because that's who comes here. So to be a good hospital, to do good treatment, we, we can't see the lens narrowly through only depression or only anxiety or only uh, uh, trauma. We have to treat in a more holistic, individualized, uh, essentially addressing all those comorbidities, and we do that. That's the way our, our system is designed. Trauma, broadly defined, is a, a, events in one's life, at any point in one's life, and they can be as narrow as a single event that lasted a matter of seconds to something that was chronic and happened over the course of decades. But events that uh, make an individual feel fundamentally at risk to their life. And that can take many, many different forms. That can take the form of a car accident. That can take the form of an abusive relationship. Uh, that can take the form of a, of a sexually inappropriate relationship. Um, and in some ways, no two traumas are the same. But the common ingredient is that they put the individual or the person's body into a state of survival mode. And what we know is that evolutionarily, we have old mechanisms for surviving either under very adverse circumstances. You know, the proverbial, uh, you know, being in, in, in the, uh, the jungle and having a, a tiger chase you, or being you know, threatened by some kind of a, a, a violent act. Our bodies go into a special state in order to preserve life. But those states come at a cost. They, and if that is not addressed in certain ways, vulnerable individuals develop illness as a result of that trauma. And it can happen right away, or it can happen decades later. Uh, and uh, the person may have lived, but, but it has a profound long-standing, it can have a profound long-standing effect on their mental health. And, and we know a lot about how those effects uh, uh, are mediated by the brain and end up affecting us behaviorally, uh, but you can't help or intervene unless it's identified and then the person gets into treatment. So that's the trauma piece. So let me, let me switch to borderline personality disorder. I, I do hesitate with the term just because it's a controversial term and the notion of there's something wrong with my personality can sound very condemning, which is of course it's not intended to be. But what it, what, to, to sort of give you the, the, the brief version of it, every one of us has a sense of who we are. 
And that sense uh, is a consolidation of both what we were born with and our experiences. And part of those experiences is a sense of a stable idea of who I am and who I am in relation to the important people around me, including people who love me and, and, and take care of me. Right? That is the fundamental experience of it that every child needs. And even children in very adverse circumstances, we know, if they have at least one individual, often a mother, but it doesn't have to be a mother, who keeps them in mind, loves them, and protects them, that's enough to form an identity that is secure and coherent and, and brings them through their lives. But that identity uh, doesn't always form without trouble, and particularly when there's adverse circumstances and for reasons that, that are probably inherited gen uh, genetic vulnerabilities that we don't fully understand. Some people emerge from childhood and adolescence without that secure sense of who they are. And that's not because they, of anything they did or because of somebody particularly failed them necessarily. But when you have that fragmented sense of self, you look for it in other places. But it, if, if nobody helps you glue that together, you can end up with very fragmented, very volatile relationships. You can reproduce some of the, the bad relationships from the past. That is, you end up um, almost unwittingly seeking out relationships that, that are not healthy. Again, that's not blaming the individual. They didn't choose that. It's not their fault. But, but we do see that it's more likely that, that they be in adverse circumstances. So you need treatments that help essentially dial that back. Now, interestingly, we have really not found any medicines, and I'm a psychiatrist, I believe medicines are helpful for a lot of people, but not for everybody, and this particular illness is best treated through psychotherapy. And we have you know, at least three or four very well thought out, developed, and, and, and researched treatments for borderline personality disorder that help uh, you know, many, many thousands of people, but could reach others with more education. Uh, if you, you ask somebody to say, what is the largest mental health facility in this country? And the answer is the Los Angeles County Jail. Uh, it is not a psychiatric facility. It is a jail. And we know from an enormous amount of research that the prison systems are, are filled past capacity with individuals with uh, chronic and acute psychiatric needs. Our criminal justice, in particular penal system, has essentially... Uh, picked up what our mental health system has failed to do and um, dealt with it in ways that I would argue are uh, often inhumane. And, that's, and I don't mean to condemn our penal system. That they're essentially doing the work because nobody else is doing it. And, and another kind of anecdote I always think of is I was teaching a course on mental illness to a, a group of policemen. Um, and I was so moved by what they were telling me which was that day in, day out, their most common call, and this was in an urban area in, in western Massachusetts, was for individuals with mental illness. And they knew they weren't the right people to be coming. They were incredibly kind and, and caring and you know, had amazing amounts of patience with these individuals given that they were not trained as mental health professionals. Uh, and th they were having to act in many ways as case managers and social workers because the system wasn't providing that. And one, one uh, more senior policeman in particular said to me that, that it broke his heart that he was now seeing the third generation in the same family of individuals who he was being called as a policeman for a disturbance or for domestic violence and so on when he remembered that individual's grandparent. And it, the system had never adequately addressed what was fundamentally a mental health issue, uh, of course, compounded by poverty, compounded by, um, and, and, and he was being called in. And, and, and I, I, all I could do was, was sympathize and, and, and see what a tragedy it was that we weren't doing a better job as a system to, to let police do what police are trained to do and let the mental health system do, do what it could do. But that, that we haven't gotten there.